Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. In this episode, Dorsey interviews another special guest that will give you hope and inspire you. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining me on another episode of the Dorsey Ross Podcast. Today we have with us Jake DeBenez, who is a certified polymath who identifies as a writer, teacher, minister, and creative thinker who lives in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Jake founded Theophany Media, a Christian entertainment and education company exploring the intersection of Christ and creativity. He has two degrees from Oklahoma Christian University, a Master of Theological Studies, and a Bachelor in Bible with a minor in Communication Studies. You will find him dabbling in poetry, short stories, books, screenplays, stage plays, academic essays, and devotionals. He likes it all. On top of this, he serves as a minister in his local church and directs a dorm at his alma mater. So, Jake, thank you for coming on the show today. I'm glad to be on. Thanks so much, Dorsey. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like you got a lot a lot of, on your plate and a lot going on in your life. Uh, a little bit. I, I, I keep busy, you know. Don't want to be bored. Right. So what's your you know, what's your hobby like? What do you, you know, what do you what's the best thing that you like to do? I'm really a writer. I love writing stories. Sometimes you know, I don't have the creative juices flowing, but when I when I get in that space, uh, I just love creating stories. But I also like consuming stories, so through books. But you know, TV and movies are just some of the the easiest ways to just consume and take in stories. So I'm right. a storyteller, story lover. That's really my hobby. Nice, that's cool. So you founded the company Theophany Media. Mm-hmm. What exactly does that Theophany Media do? Yeah, Theophany Media <laughs> was kind of created as my as an organization to sort of do all the things that I wanted to do. So, so I I created it to really just be a place where we have discussions of faith and art, uh, but also some place that we can produce art in a various forms that honors God and glorifies God. So one of our kind of flagship things is the Creatively Christian podcast, where um, not me, but some other hosts interview different Christian creatives who are just creating cool things for the glory of God. So we just want to really inspire other creators. And then we want to help people have good Christian art to engage with and consume. So yeah, we got our hands in a lot of different things. That's awesome. Why do you think it's important to have conversations about faith and art? Yeah, so I, I think what's important that we we, where we talk about this because if we don't have the conversation, sometimes the art we create can. Well, there's different spectrums, right? There's the the really cheesy Christian art where if we don't really talk about how should this inform, sometimes we default to the well, we just need to make sure that Jesus is in every sentence and everybody like converts by the end of the movie. It's just like really um, strongly Christian art. Then the other end of the spectrum is like, uh, you know, a Christian comes into their art, but none of their faith shows up at all into that. So I think it's important to have the conversations. So we avoid kind of our automatic tendency to go to the extremes so that we can create something that's good art, good storytelling, but also reflects our values as Christians. So I think that's why it's really important. If we don't talk about it, uh, it probably won't be as good as it can be. So by talking about it, by having those conversations, we can put some really, really cool stuff out into the world. Yeah, absolutely. I know, you know, that I've seen some, you know, Christian movies and I'm like, Man, why did they ever make this? You know, <laughs> and then I saw some yeah. other things. You know, like the movie I can only imagine. You know, for me that was a great movie. Yeah, the movie with the Jeremy Camp story. You know, that mm-hmm. was 
you know, pretty decent movie, you know. There's a lot of people talking about, I don't know if you've seen it, and you can, you know, tell me what you think about it. But, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you know, the chosen, about Jesus' disciples. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that, and what do you think about that? I I haven't seen it. I feel like I'm left out because a lot of the Christian artists that I, you know, in conversation with point to that as some really good Christian art, but I haven't seen it yet. It's, it's on my to-do list. I'll get to it soon, but yeah, I know I'm missing out. So I have seen some clips and stuff and it does seem really good and some interview with, with Dallas Jenkins, the director. So yeah, I can. It, it looks pretty good to me, honestly. Right. I haven't seen it either. So you're not you're not alone oh. in that boat where you know you're not the only one that hasn't seen it. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> you originally wrote the book "Who We Are: Seven Christian Identities to Shape Your Life." What inspired you to write your book and tell us a little bit more about that book? Yeah. Um. I wrote the I wrote this book actually originally it was a college class um for some years I've worked primarily with college students in, at my church where I serve as a minister and I taught this class for them about sort of forming a Christ-centered identity and um it just kind of seemed like I had put all this work into a class and I was like why don't I just take the next step and make it a book that would be easy right well it was a lot harder than I thought. It wasn't actually so easy to just turn that into a book, but um, I got a publisher interested. And so I turned it into a book. Um, but a lot of my research, you know, in grad school and in ministry has been a lot about forming an identity in Christ, spiritual formation. So a lot of those interests kind of converge in this book. Gotcha. What does that look like to you? What is your Christian identity? And what makes our, our identity specific, specifically Christian? It's honestly one of the hardest questions. And I mean, I could probably write a whole book just on like trying to narrow down this definition. Um, because in the, in the book, I present just sort of a general definition to kind of get into some specific applications. But at the end of the day, I think Christian identity is when our our being, our life is directed towards Christ, directed towards God. So, you know, what makes up a human being? There's a lot of stuff, but in general, you have like our mind, our, you know, our, our body, the things we do, our feelings, those kind of things. If those are, are pointing and in service of God, we have Christian identity. The, I, I like to think of that kind of pointing or that orientation as sort of Christian identity, because we're not ever going to be perfect. We're not ever going to be exactly like Jesus hundred percent, but if we're kind of like on that journey, if we're sort of pointed in that direction, uh, I think that's really what we're supposed to be striving for. We can't reach perfection, but hopefully we can get pretty good. Right. Yeah. We'll, unfortunately we'll never you know, reach perfection on this earth. But, you know, we will at some point when we, you know, when we get to heaven, you know, we'll see him face to face, you know, especially when it's, you know, our bodies are, you know, always at war, you know, with our spirit and our soul and with sin and everything. It's, it's hard to become perfect in this in this lifetime. Very much. Yeah. <laughs> you talk about seven Christian identities in that book. Tell us a little bit more about what those identities are or what they look like. Yeah, so what I did, what I did in the book is it's divided into seven to seven kind of aspects of identity. Um there's probably more like there's so there's a lot of different ways to reflect Christ, um, I suppose, but I I kind of choose seven, seven identities um, seven sort of ways to live this out. And um, I chose those seven by first thinking of what are the common identities? What are the things we usually put our identity in? So some of those that I look at are like success, 
we commonly put our identity in success or also it could be family. Um, you know, if, if our family's, you know, cool or something famous, we make that a part of our identity or even the opposite. If our family's bad, we get caught up in that. Um, or happiness is another one. Like, so what I started with is looking at what are the things we commonly put our identity in, but we shouldn't. And then what are the replacements? So just to go over a few of them, uh, for the family one, instead of putting our identity in our earthly family, we need to put our identity in the family of God. So whether our earthly family is good or bad, what ultimately matters is the people of God, our fellow believers that we have, that's where our identity should be. That's what we should be focusing on. Not that, you know, we should ignore our families or something, you know. There is a commandment to honor father and mother. Like, that's still in there. Uh, although, <laughs> Jesus Jesus does say some harsh things against family, though. I'll, I'll say that. However, at the end of the day, what's what's more important? Oh, it's the family of God. And so one of the first ones I deal with is sin and grace. Uh, There are some Christians that they overemphasize how sinful and terrible they are. And to some extent, that's okay. Um, We do need to recognize that we're not perfect and that we do sin. But I remind people that our true identity is in grace. We are sinful, but God has given us grace. So it kind of erases that to some extent. Um, and, and so that's sort of the, that's some of the things I go throughout, throughout the book. There's a lot more, but that's just kind of the sneak peek, I suppose. What, what's one of the ones that you think that you most struggle with when it comes to your Christian identity? So for me, it's the success one. I put my, my identity in success too often. Uh, I'm an achiever. I want to, I want to do a lot of stuff, right? You read my bio. I, I do lots of things and I like to get recognition for it. You know, I have to fight this urge to want to be famous and notable all the time. Um, And and so I got to fight back against that and instead put my identity in, in things that really matter um, in Christ and in specifically for that one in a heart for God, instead of having a heart for the things of this earth, uh, you know, right, where or if we put our treasure on earth, moth and rust destroys. But if we put our treasure in heaven, um, that's a, that's eternal. That matters more ultimately. So I constantly have to work on for myself the problem of wanting to have success and achievement and fame and fortune. When in reality, I shouldn't be striving after that stuff. I should be striving after what eternally matters. And that's, you know, developing a relationship with God, a heart for God, putting my treasure where it matters, which is in heaven. If there's one thing that people, that you hope people will gain or, you know, get an insight from, you know, from your book, what would that be? I wrote the book primarily with those college students in mind, uh, with 20-somethings, with young adults, uh, because that's where I fit, too. That's the people I relate to. Now, it, of course, can be, you know, it's good information for everybody, but really I'm imagining the person that reads it is this this kind of 20-something. They're not really sure what to do with their life. Maybe they've been in, in church all their life, but they're not just really feeling it. So I hope to really inspire that person to think about um, the ways that even if you go to church every Sunday, that we've kind of missed out on putting Christ as the center of our identity. You know, I think some parts of the book could could really kind of convict some people and make them think, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, I was putting my identity in my political party or in you know, my success or in my past, but no, my identity isn't something more than that. So I really hope people um, think about the ways where they've kind of gone through the motions and accidentally put their identity in some really destructive things. Right. What do you see for the young people, you know, that either in church or not even in church, but what do you see and what is your hope for the future of the church? Especially when it comes to the young people of today. Yeah. So I'm 24 years old. 
I'm a youngin, not that old at all. And, uh, and I have a huge passion for my generation and, and those a little bit younger and a little bit older than me. Um, I have a huge passion for young people. And, um, I think that, I think that there's going to be a lot of good stuff in the future that young people will, I, I think the church is going to be awesome. Um, there's going to probably be some growing pains, but, uh, I just wish that the church uh, understood that, you know, this young people, although they will probably, you know, it might be a little bit until they're all the, you know, the senior pastors or they become the elders of the church. Uh, they are the church of the present. Young people have gifts right now, um, and we need to respect that and empower them to lead and to act and to serve right now. Um Instead of just saying, okay, you know, get back to me when you're in your 40s and you have a couple kids, then you can be contributing to the church. You know, no, we need to recognize the people's young people's gifts right now. So right. that's, that's kind of my hope. And, and I hope that the church kind of gets better at that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And obviously you're young, but is there another desire or another drive that want, makes you want to speak to the young people of your age? Yeah, I just, you know, of, of course I'm, I'm one of them. That's definitely a main one. Like you mentioned, um, I just, I just think there could be a lot of good, um, you know, every new generation comes with new problems, of course, but they also come with new solutions, um, new ways of thinking and and so sometimes we got to parse out okay what what are you believing that's maybe not great and then what are you believing that is great you know we got to parse that out got to figure that out um but i just i'm excited and and i i want to fight for this generation to help this generation um because i think the church is going to be stronger when all of the parts of the body are working together so you know if uh if the eyeball isn't talking to the brain, you know, we got a problem. And so I just want the whole body to work together to the best of our ability. And young people are a part of that. And so I just want to see them involved. Right. For those of us who are a little bit older, I'm, you know, 44. And, you know, there are some older people that may, may not listen to this and whatnot. But what would you say to the older generations that may have maybe a myth about the younger generation and say, you know, they may say things that, that are not really true about the younger people. What would you say to them? Yeah, so um, I've been asking this question to a lot of the college students that I have here at, at the dorm that I run at Oklahoma Christian University. And, um, I think some of the themes that stick out, young people are, are very, they're sensitive to issues. Now, maybe we could argue, you know, being too sensitive in some areas, but, um, this generation has a huge heart for the hurting, for the broken, um, for the disenfranchised, the marginalized. And, you know, I think... I think sometimes um, there's a there's this idea that young people are just, you know, saying these things or posting these things um, just to just to be cool, just to virtue signal, just to show all their friends, hey, I'm progressive and, and, and nice and stuff. But I think there's a genuine heart. These people genuinely care about the world and they will fight for it. Um, but they're going to need the help of the older generation. So I encourage older people to listen, to just open their ears, um, open their homes, go out to lunch with these people um, and just listen to them because I think they have some really good ideas and they, I think they have a passion, um, but they're going to need to work with other people to really get some of these done and get those problems solved. So right. I think that's what I would say. So what are the, some of the next projects that you are working on? And would you ever consider possibly, you know, producing a, 
you know, maybe a Christian documentary or, you know, a Christian movie at mm. some point? Well, I got a lot of projects, <laughs> of course. Um, I'm hoping to publish some uh, some fiction soon-ish. We'll see how that happens because I'm a, you know, that's my true love fiction writer. Love writing nonfiction. Love doing that. But uh, fiction is just kind of a fun way to instruct and help people. Um, although I try to make my nonfiction fun too, but you know, it's, it's different, right? Um, yeah, I would love to, I would love to do some kind of documentary or some kind of work. Um, I'm really focusing in, I'm focusing on, uh, trying to figure out ways to help young people in the church. Um, I'm sort of in the beginning stages of a local sort of conference for that. Uh, I would love to do a documentary. I've always wanted to. Um, but, you know, there are some certain challenges, technical challenges mostly to overcome. But I think that can be a very fun, interesting visual way to instruct. I don't know about a movie. I got some movie scripts in me. But I got to make the right connections and, you know, rub shoulders with the right people. So right. if anybody out there listening or watching, you know, if you're the right connection. Well, maybe one of those. the, uh, maybe one of the, you know, the brothers, you know, that create these movies, maybe they'll, maybe they'll listen to this. Love it. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's have some conversations. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jake, you know, thank you again for joining us. You know, I greatly appreciate having you on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much. I love talking about this stuff. I'm passionate about it. I love sharing it. You know, uh, you, you don't become a writer to make money. Um, it's because you have this message and you got to get it out there. Um, right. So I appreciate opportunities like this. To, to get that message out there. So thank you so much. Well, I'm I'm an author as well, and I, I completely yeah. agree with you that, it, you know, you're not, you're not in it for the money. So. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. If there was something that you would want to say to the young people that may listen to this later on, what would that be, in a, you know, encouragement word? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Good question. I would say hang in there, but... You know, keep that fire. Um, The world might try to quench that fire or tell you you're not old enough or you're not smart enough or whatever. But if you have a fire to change the world, to make the world a better place, to help people, um, don't let that flame go. Fan that flame. Uh, It it might require a season of waiting and patience, um, but... Don't let that go because the world needs that. The world needs those passionate people who want to make a difference. So Amen. That's what I would say. Yeah. Well, again, thank you again for joining us. And guys, thank you again for joining in and tuning in. And, you know, please share, like, you know, donate to the podcast. And until next time, have a great day. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Please like, share, and tell others about the show. Also, please check out the other podcast episodes. And if you would like, donate to this podcast and buy Dorsey a coffee. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.